Hey friends, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Patrick. I create tutorials about .NET and Blazor here on this channel. And in this tutorial, we will have a look at the full stack. And that's why I stated this a full course of a Blazor WebAssembly application. Simple example. In this case, you will see what we will do in a minute. Full stack means we've got three projects, meaning a client project for the Blazor WebAssembly client. Then also a web API, this is then the server. We've got a shared project for the models that we will exchange between the client and the server. And we will not only use the web API, we will go one step further and use Entity Framework and the SQL Server Express database, everything available for free to, well, store our data persistently there and then get the data, change the data and so on and display everything on the client. And before we start, thank you so much to my very first patron. This really means the world to me. If you want to support me too and get source code access, for instance, to this full course here you see right now, then maybe you want to check out the link in the video description for my brand new, really, Patreon page. And also behind the scenes action, discounts for courses and other stuff. Thank you very much for considering. And now let's start with the tutorial. So we start by simply creating a new project in Visual Studio 2022. In my case, it's the community edition, so available for free. I want to create a Blazor WebAssembly app. Of course, you can also just search for Blazor here and then you will find a server app and a web assembly app. You also have empty apps. This just means that we have no default pages there, no examples in there. But let's here now use the Blazor web assembly app. This will help you tremendously. And we will create a simple video game library because the Gamescom is not that long ago. So let's try to find the famous new games maybe in this library. Very important here is that you check ASP.NET Core hosted. This means that you will get a web API project already here in your solution. So we've got our web service then where we can then make our database calls. For instance, we will also get a client project, which is then Blazor WebAssembly and also a shared project. But let's have a look at the solution explorer when we finally create this thing. There we are. So let's open the solution explorer and pin this maybe. And again, as you can see, we've got the client project. This is Blazor. We've got the server project here out of the box, which is our uh, web API with old school controllers here, still like them more than the minimal API. And again, the shared project. And in this example project, you already see that we've got this weather forecast model here shared with both the client and the server. So both can use them and this is just awesome. When we run this, the starting project is the server in this case, but it will give you everything, the API and also the client. So let's just have a quick look. There we are. Have you seen the loading screen? There it is. Because with WebAssembly, we have to download some stuff. Don't be scared, these almost 10 megabytes will be reduced significantly when you publish this. So it is actually not that much. And really guys, when you have a look at all the websites and web applications out there, then 10 megabytes is actually not that much. And again, this is only here while developing. So we see the uh, that we have to download some stuff when we use Blazor WebAssembly. And when we go to the network tab and here was them and let me just reload this and maybe uh, we have to also clear the application cache. Yep, let's do that real quick. So here clear site data and again we go to the network tab and then was them. We reload and now we see a dot net dot wasm, right? So this is the file in this case that gets downloaded. And then we get some other example pages here. Again, this is not there when we use the empty templates with Blazor WebAssembly and server, but here now we've got, we've got this example. On the counter page, we have interactivity. We can just click there and the counter increases. We already see some binding here, right? So we actually just display a counter variable and when we click 
it will be increased and we also see the variable and with fetch data again we've got a web service call so again under network and then fetch xhr which stands for xml http request we see there it is this is the actual call right localhost weather forecast so this is the controller name and in the response we see the data in the preview we see it a bit better formatted and this is exactly what we see here some random weather data so when we reload we also see different values here so it's not the real stuff there's no real weather api used here this is just example data and to see this here represented in the code again this is the model here in the shared folder with a date only temperature in celsius summary and then simply the fahrenheit temperature with a function in essence then we've got the web api controller here and with that you see some example summaries and this is then the api call the endpoint here so this is a get call so an http get request is made please excuse me if i won't go that much into detail for that i've got other tutorials other courses like the dotnet web academy and here then we see that randomly we've got five weather forecast uh yeah weather forecasts some weather forecast data you get the idea i think all right so that's that and then on the client on the other side we've got the pages here and there for instance the fetch data page and this is again the weather forecast stuff the example stuff and then i'm stopping the example or i'm stopping talking about the example and we will create our little game library so here then is the actual call so this is actually already lots of stuff that shows you how blazer WebAssembly works together with the web api but now let's create our own stuff and for that i'd say we start actually on the back end and we also start here in the shared folder because i want to create a video game model so let me just add a new item we call this a video game. Real quick, the .NET Web Academy is open for enrollment, but only for two more days. So enrollment closes in two days. Spots are also filling up very, very fast. If you don't know it yet, the .NET Web Academy is all about getting you job ready in the .NET web development world with the web api entity framework blazer on the client deployment with azure git for source control and so on designing with tailwind css lots and lots of stuff to learn in there we've got a great community already students are very happy about the academy so maybe you want to check it out too links in the video description thank you very much and now let's continue with the tutorial and this is actually a public class and let's just say with prop this thing gets an id which is an integer then we have a string for the title let's say then also another string for the publisher maybe and i also want to see the release year so maybe an integer for the release yeah all right and this is the nullable warning so what we can do here we can actually the title can be required like that and the publisher well if you don't know it then let's just set this to string empty all right that's it and now again for the back end the next step would be the controller actually what we can also do is create services and repositories to use the repository pattern and then dependency injection but again please bear with me here i don't want to go too deep there are other tutorials where i do this and again also courses and if you have questions about that please just ask them in the comments below and i'll be more than happy to create additional tutorial video videos here here now i'm using a fat controller so-called fat controller similar to this thing here where the whole logic to get the data is here in the controller again not best practice you would use separate services inject these services then in the controller and also inject repositories that only make this uh, the database calls or the, the access to the database 
then there and you would then inject the repository in the service and so on the chain goes on to the controller. Anyways, let's uh, add a new, no, not a new item. In this case, we right click and then say we add a new controller here. And this thing is an API controller. You already can create uh, controllers with example codes, but let's just create an empty one. I think this is a good way to learn. So here an API controller and let me call this the video game controller. And in here now, similar again to the weather forecast controller, we can actually create simply one method to get some data. Now what I like to do is create a public async function with task now, returning a task, an action result. It is actually be sufficient actually sufficient to just return, return an I action result. But what I like to do is already use the actual implementation class here, the action result, and then also a type of, for instance, now video games, right? And with control and period, we get the using directive on top. And here, let's just call this get all video games. And here now we maybe just return example video games and we use the object initializer here so let's just create a new video game and yep id would be one and this is just the first example we will then use entity framework with secret server express as everything again available for free to uh, really access the data from uh, the database so and let's just say let's just and one video game again I said very new so maybe Tetris it's a new game right and here now the publisher well actually it was eLorg but let's say in 1989 it was Nintendo with the Game Boy so here now Nintendo got the rights and uh, then the release year for that was 1989 isn't that a long time ago and this is still one of the best games ever made by a guy called Alexei. Correct me if I'm wrong. So this is a great video game and this is what I want to return. So let's now return. We can actually just return the list, but what you return with a web API is actually, or what you want to return maybe is a status code like OK200, right? You see there, status 200, OK. This just means that everything went fine. What you can also return is, for instance, a bad request, which is a status 400 or, you know, this not found 404, right? But in my case, let's just return the list with OK. Now, regarding the routes, what's the route? You see it here on top that the route for the controller here is API and then in brackets controller. So this means the name of the controller, which is the term which stands in front of the controller term. So simply video game. So the URL or the route would be API forward slash and then video game. And then how to access or how to get this endpoint here. Well, the method is called get all video games and this is now magic. It's like a convention and the web API then knows, okay, I think because the name of the function is get anything that the developer here wants also to use the HTTP request method get with no additional route. Meaning when we now use API video game, then we should get the data. Shall we try that? I would say we try that. So let's restart the application. All right, there we are. And now let's just add API and then video game in here in the address bar. And you see, this is the data that we just entered, right? And let me just refresh this. And in this case, now select all because we uh, access this like a page, right? But still with that, you see this is the URL now, our route request method. As I said, it's just get 200 OK is what we get 
uh, returned from our web service, from our web API. And this is now the data. Maybe let's just add one more game. So let me just copy this. And another brand new amazing game was or is Pong, right? Publisher, do you know it? Atari and release date way back 1972 for the arcade machine. So let's save that. We restart the application. And with that, there it is. Let me just reload. Yep. And voila, we are done. So here now you see this is the data. Now we could use it like that, right? It's, it's somehow a user interface, but we can do better. And we also want to learn some Blazor here, right? So the next part then would be to create a page or a component to display our video game data, all right? So how would that work? Again, we see the pages and here now in the fetch data page, for instance, you also see the page directive where we then add a route. And this is the only place where you need to put this. All right. There is no routing file similar to other spa frameworks in the JavaScript world where you have to configure all the routes. You just say add page and that's it magic. This is everything you have to do. Then when you want to make a web service call, you see it here, you inject the HTTP client, the same thing that is done down here, right? We've got the HTTP client here, and then we get a function get from JSON async, meaning that uh, we're actually receiving JSON data from the web API. And then we turn this into the actual class in our case, in this case here, a weather forecast, but now let's do the same with video games, right? And here they're using a table to display them. Well, maybe we can use something else here. So let's go back again to the solution explorer. Again, this is a page. What else you get is uh, shared components, right? Everything here is kind of component based. This is the beautiful stuff of single page apps or single page application frameworks in essence. Again, you know this maybe already from JavaScript frameworks like uh, Angular or React. And now in Blazor, of course, you can do this too. Really great stuff, really great component model. And here now you see the nav menu component within the nav menu razor file. And in here now you see other components like the nav link, right? So this is what you can actually see when we access again our Blazor application here. This is the nav menu and then the nav link is another component nested into the nav menu. All right, so that's that and now a page in essence is also a component because we could say, for instance, we remove the page directive and then use another page where we then use the fetch data component. But one step after another, let's now create another page for our video games. So add new razor component. And if you hear strange noises, this is my new baby girl. I'm really sorry about that. If it's getting on your nerves, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that way she's sleeping. She's currently in the baby sling. So yeah, sleeping, that's great. But maybe she's streaming something and uh, then you might hear some strange or funny noises. Well, anyway, so now we create the video games page. There we are. And again, we can say page forward slash video games, for instance, let me just save that restart the application. And if you're wondering why I am restarting this stuff here manually, well, hot reload is giving me a hard time sometimes, but it's too often that I say, all right, I'm just working with hot reload because sometimes I do not see the change it simply does not work. I don't know why. So I am just reloading uh, the stuff here manually. So now let's just enter video games. And there it is, our video games page. Isn't that nice? Already works. Let me real quick add this to the nav menu here. So we just copy and paste this. Video games is the route. We can also call this video games, of course. And regarding the icon, I think there is a great icon 
a Percha. Let's see if this exists. And there it is. Yes, there it is. And if you're wondering why Aperture, and if you're not from the gaming world, well, maybe I can just say the people that played Portal know what this is all about. Aperture Science is a company in there. Anyways, this is not the topic of this video, but great games as well. So we've got the NEF uh, link now, so we can go to fetch data and then now also to our video games page. Awesome stuff. Now back to the code in here now, video games, and now we want to see them. So maybe for now, let's just use an unordered list, all right, like that. And only if we actually have video games, uh, we want to display them. So what we can do is simply we say, uh, also here we have a list of video games. Did I really call this? Wait a sec, this is wrong. Video games at the page, of course. Now we could use it like that, add the using, but what I rather would do is we have this beautiful imports file here. And in there, we can also add this, the whole using actually, like that. Now go back, remove this, and now we still know the video game type. Isn't that nice? All right, so these are our video games. We've got a new list of uh, video games again. And here now, what I want to do is uh, simply ask if we have any video games at all, then we display the unordered list, right? And if not, we display a loading screen or a simple loading text. So with add if we can add some code here, this is amazing. And I just want to ask if the games count is small or equal to zero, then we display a little span, not a pen, a span with loading video games. All right. And if we have some, then let's display them again in an unordered list. This is the beginning uh, of the unordered list. And then here we can use a for each, tap, tap twice, game in video games, like that. And here now we just say, oh, it's actually called games. Yeah. <laughs> and now here we just say, show me the game title like that um, with also the game publisher and also the game release here. I know great format, right? But again, we can change that. So now the last thing we want to add is the call to get the, the games, right? And let's do this right when this page was uh, accessed, when this component here starts, or in another word, when this component initializes. And for that, we can use one of Blazor's lifecycle methods. So we can actually override them. And here now you see them. For instance, on after render is one of this life cycle or these life cycle methods or on initialized on parameters set, right? These are the most famous ones, I'd say, and these are also the only ones that we really need here. And what I would like to do is really use on initialized async because this is the very first one. Then you've got on parameters set meaning and we will need that probably when we want to edit a video game or create a, no, not create a new one, but when we edit one, then we maybe want to create another page where we then set an ID and only when the ID is really set, then we have the data. So it could be the case when you have parameters and uh, you want to do something with them, 
and you already do something with them or you try to do something with them in the uninitialized, the parameter is actually not set. And this is why you've got this method here because there you know you've got the parameters and you've got the data and now you can do something, something with that. Again, it's as always, it's really late and uh, it's, it's sometimes a bit hard to focus. Yeah, when a little baby is uh, fighting against the baby sling. Anyways, with parameters set, you get the idea you have got the parameters set and then you can do something with them. And on after render is when the component has been rendered. In this case, then you can do something else. But in this case now, on initialized async, great stuff. So here we add the async and now we also inject the HTTP client. So HTTP client, call this HTTP and here now, uh, let's just say var video game or well, first result maybe. Oh no, actually there's already the games. So here now I just say wait HTTP again get from JSON async. We want to get a list of video games and now comes the URI. And if you paid attention, you know that it's now API and then video game games video game video game controller right that's the name so a video game this is what we want and we need another angle bracket here and now this should work so this is our page let's see if you now get our data restart the application we see the video games loading, but focus, focus. Of course, this can't work. So we do not set the games here. And we have an error. Yeah, could be the case. So le let me just change that a little. So our result is this. And if the result is actually not null, then we say that our games is now the result. All right, so now this should work. There they are. You saw the loading screen, right? Big fat loading screen. Now we've got Tetris from Nintendo and Pong, Atari, great stuff. So this is how we can now get the data and see the data. But I think it is not that nice to get the data here from the controller directly it's actually just dummy data right it would be great to add entity framework here and I would say this is exactly what we do next so what do we need to do that well first of all we just stop the application and download SQL server if you haven't already you can simply google for that there it is SQL server downloads and then you can actually get the Express or the Developer Edition. Doesn't really matter. This is up to you, but these editions are free and we can work with them. And another thing that I can recommend is actually the SQL Server Management Studio as well. Again, just Google for it. Or when you install SQL Server, then they will recommend to also install the Server Management Studio this is just a great tool to manage your SQL Server databases. But the funny thing is you actually don't need a user interface to have a look at your database because you will use the CLI to create it. And then we will use our web API and Blazor to do other stuff, other magic. But the first thing is now here we want to do when SQL Server is installed, we want to use Entity Framework with Code First Migration to create our database with a video game table. So how is this done? Well, we first need some NuGet packages. So Solution Explorer and here in the server project, right click Manage NuGet Packages and go to the Browse tab, very important. I forget this lots of times. Don't include the pre-release for this example here. And then we look for first Microsoft and there it is Entity Framework Core. 802 million downloads, that's nice. So install that, please. This is the first one. Then we need something similar, 
the SQL Server Provider, SQL Server, and there it is. Microsoft SQL Server Database Provider for NG Framework Core. Only 370 million downloads. I accept. And the last thing, design, shared design time components for NG Framework Core tools. So with that then, code first migration will work. And the last thing, because I want to use the CLI for code first migration here, are the actual EF core tools and we can install them with .NET tool install. Well, you need the .NET SDK of course to make this work, but I guess when you're that far in the tutorial, you already did that. And then dash dash global .NET EF. And in my case, it will tell me, hey, you already installed that. So what you can do is you can uninstall it, for instance, and then install it again, like that. And in my case, now I get the version 7.0.10. All right, and with .NET-EF or only .NET-EF, we see there it is, a beautiful unicorn with and the framework core .NET command line tools 7.0.10. And with that, you already see the commands here, right? We got database, we got DB context and migrations, and we only need migrations and database to add migrations and update or create the database. So let's do that next. But first, we need a data context or a database context. I just call this data context, but it's actually a DB context where we will add our database set for the video games. So here in the server project, the way I do this and many other, many other developers do this as well, we create a data folder and here now we add a new item and this is now our data context, let's say, or application DB context, whatever you like. We inherit from a DB a context and then create our constructor like that, but here this thing needs a parameter which is of type DB context options, our new data context here. And we also call this options. And we also call the base function here with our options. And now the only data set we want to add here, and why do we need a data set? Well, with the data set, we tell Entity Framework that we want the data here see re we want to see the data here represented as a table. So it's in essence a property. Call this DB set of type now video game. That one. We call this also video games. So this will be the name of the table. All right. So usually you just pluralize the name of the table, but there are debates of that actually. So you can also call the table just video game, but I think video games also is a great name for a table. So this means that Energy Framework knows as soon as we start a new migration or we create a new migration that we will create a video games table. All right. Now the last thing that is, uh, or it's not the last thing, but another thing in our steps here to get a database is to create a connection string, meaning how do we connect uh, to our the, the web API to our database. For that, while developing, we can use our app settings, all right? Later, when you deploy this to Azure, for instance, you would then use some environment variables, for instance, or even the uh, Azure Key Vault to securely store your connection string, maybe. But again, in this simple example, let's just use connection strings. And you see it here already suggested in the app settings JSON file. We can create a new section called connection strings. And then by default, you would create a default connection. And now here with EF Core 7, or now only called Entity Framework 7, actually would look like that. First server, in our case, localhost, or in my case, because I installed it on my local machine, backslash, backslash, and then SQL express. 
with a semicolon and then comes the database name. This is now the video video game db. All right. Then we say trusted underscore connection is true. And after that, this is new to Android Framework 7, we say trust server certificate also true. That's it. This is our connection string. Server localhost SQL Express, the database, which is or has to be an equal sign actually and not a colon. Video game DB, trusted connection is true, and then trust server certificate also set to true. This hopefully works. And after that, we go to the program CS and add the DB context there. So up here, we say builder services, and then add DB context. This will be our data context. And this will again get some options because we want to tell that we actually want to use SQL Server, right? Make sure to add the reference here. And now here we say options use SQL, that was SQL Server. And with that, we again have to provide the connection string. And for that, we've got the builder configuration and then get connection strings. And you see it here, it's simply shorthand for get section connection strings. And then here, that would be our default connection. And we have to add a parenthesis. Yep. And then you're good. Isn't it great? That's it. So this is the complete configuration. I know maybe a bit much in the beginning. So we have the data context, we have the app settings for the connection string and then simply add the DB context as a service. And uh, right at the beginning, of course, we need new get packages and the .NET EF Core tools. But with that, then we can already run our migration. Again, .NET EF it is, but we have to be at the right folder. So when we have a look here, this is the solution folder. So we first enter this folder here and then also CD server to really be in the server project because here is the data that the migration needs. Very first thing now, .NET EF migrations at and then initial or initial create because with that we will also create the database. We hit return and when everything went right, we get a migrations file out of that. Build succeeded, this looks nice. And now in the Solution Explorer, migrations, initial create, and here you can see what the migration, what any framework will do when you run another command where we then say, yep, this is what I wanna do to my database. You see an up method and the down method. The down method will be called when we uh, roll back this migration. So it will simply drop the table video games. But when we now create, or when we wanna use this migrations, run it will really, then we create the video games table. And you see that from our model, it took the properties and here now we've got the fields for the table ID, which will then be an identity field already. So automatic, uh, increments the ID then with the new, uh, new you know what I mean, new entry here, searching for the names, for the terms here. The title, the publisher, and the release year. This looks great. So next thing to do is .NET EF database, and then already update, not create update, but with update, we also create this table. All right, this looks good. And here, as you can see, the commands create database, right? It will also create this database and then also the table. And now let me just open Management Studio to have a quick look. There we are, we hit connect. 
Go to databases. There's our video game database. You can ignore the time tracker database. This is from the .NET Web Academy. But here now we see tables, video games, also the EF migrations history. This is internal stuff just for entity framework. Again, can ignore this actually. But here now we can right click, edit to up to 100 rows and we see nothing, of course, because we haven't added anything yet. But let's change that. So first thing, what I like to do is here now we can, well, I actually want to get rid of the mock data here. So let me just copy that stuff. So the first title was Tetris and I actually know this, so I do not have to copy that. So 1989, only the first entry here. Okay, so that we really see the difference. But again, because again, when we run this and hopefully I find the right tab, there it is, we go to video games Again, we see them too, right? Tetris and Pong, because this is not the database stuff, all right? So I really just wanna get the database data, database data, nice. So here now, what we can do is, our list is something different now. Now it's empty. And to get access to the, to the database, we use dependency injection to inject our data context. And what we can do here now is first add a private read-only data context. Call this thing underscore context because of the read-only, private read-only. And now control period, or just open the light bulb here, right, the quick fix menu. And actually here, not the type, the, the context here actually, we can generate a constructor where we also inject the context now, all right? So with that, we've got the context now available in our controller. Again, usually a better practice, practice would be to use a service. So in essence, you would just create another file, another class that then injects the data context. And here the controller only injects the service and just forwards a request and the service then forwards the request maybe to a repository. The repository injects then finally the data context and returns that then back to the service. The service then maybe turns the actual uh, data that is returned, the objects then in a data transfer objects. I know lots of buzzwords here and then returns this to the controller and this then returns it to the, uh, to the client. We do this actually again in the dot and web Academy, for instance, or also in other tutorials and courses, but this here to give you just a quick tutorial, but we are already a couple of minutes in, right? So I hope you're still with me. Thank you very much to watching uh, this uh, tutorial that far. I love you guys. Anyways, we've got the context. So now our list here actually we can uh, already uh, use it here. So var list now is, let's say, wait. So now we've got something asynchronous here. Cont there it is already, IntelliCode, so nice. Context video games, but we turn this into a, a list to list async, all right? So with context video games, we access our database set, our table video games, and that's it, all right? Beautiful stuff because now we can use link to also filter that. For instance, we could do something like where, and then uh, we can uh, say where the G for game, game title now is something like that, or the year, which will maybe makes more sense, right? Maybe you want to filter by the release year, and then you say where this is greater than 19. 80, something like that really, but uh, yeah, something for another tutorial maybe. So here now we've got our list of video games from the database. So let's again restart the application. There it is, loading video games. There we have now only Tetris and to make really, really sure that it's really just the database data, let's just add another one. So here for instance, space invaders. This is from the Taito 
corporation title corporation in the year 1978 that's the one and now Pay attention here. I just changed the entry. I added the entry in the database. I'm not reloading or restarting the application. I just reload the page and I get the, the data. Isn't that nice? So here again, uh, reload. This is the call and also we see the data here. And now again, we can do great stuff. For instance, you see 1989, 1978, maybe you wanna order this by the release year. So what we can do is now in here, we say order, come on, order by, and then G, uh, G, and turn that into a list, restart. And now the order is different, right? So again, great stuff. Now, one more thing I'd like to change before we cover the other CRUD operation. So we've got read, right, with the get HTTP request here, but we also can create, update, and delete stuff. So what I wanna do is change the way the data is displayed on our page. An ordered list, well, it works, but not that nice maybe. So what I love is the so-called quick grid that will come with a .NET eight out of the box when I remember properly. But uh, with .NET 7, we also have to install this thing. So when we go to video games here, again, instead of the unordered list, we can add a little grid. But here now in .NET 7, we have to install the NuGet package. So right click the client project in this case, manage NuGet packages. And here we just enter quick grid, so there it is already. And we have to include the pre-releases in this case. And this is the one, Microsoft ASP.NET Core components, quick grid. But here now I have to use the alpha, not .NET 8 preview, because uh, we're using, or our target framework here now is .NET 7. So the alpha version it is still works just great. We accept, and with that now, let's just try that. We go here, and here now we just say quick grid. That's actually the one, but let me add that to the import razor. So using quick grid, and now hopefully this works, but we also have to set the items as you can see here, T grid item. So let's do that real quick. So items, and this has to be an I queryable, the type, right? So what you can do is simply say games, and then as queryable like that. Almost done, it's again, really, really quick. What we can do here because the next step is simply the property column where we set, well, a property. And this now, G for games again, is for instance, uh, the title of the game. All right, can close this here. And now let's just copy and paste that for also the publisher and the date or the release year. So release here it is, we save that, we remove that, and now restart our application. And we see the grid, isn't that nice? Of course, we can change the style, maybe not the best, but uh, it is really clean. And we have a table somehow, right? And the best thing is that we can also add buttons here, for instance to, well, get to an edit page or anything else, right? So for instance, if you wanna change now the Space Invaders uh, entry, then we can again add another column with an edit button or even a delete button, anything like that. But this is something for part two. So please, if you're interested in the other CRUD operations with Blazor WebAssembly, a Web API, Entity Framework, SQL Server, 
click on the video here on the screen to see the next part of this video. Until then, thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Take care.